Um, just in case you're new to my ministry, hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Matt McMillan. I'm a Christian author. I've written seven books. All my books are available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle. Check them out if you get some time. Now, I do have a goal to re-release all of my books this year in hardcover. So be on the lookout for that. I'm also still writing. So if you're waiting on the next book to be released, I do have some stuff in, in the works. Um, and I hope to have that released by the end of the year. We'll see how that goes. But I always have some type of goal to achieve. Um, I'm a type A personality. That's just how I'm always working. All right. Um, I also have a podcast and I'm recording the latest episode live on Instagram. This is where I record my podcast. So if you're watching live, thank you so much for joining me live. I appreciate that. It's always encouraging to see people watching live. But if you're listening in the future on the podcast, hit that pause button and leave me a quick review if you don't mind. Also, if you've read any of my books, go back to Amazon and leave me a review. I do get a lot of emails about my books after somebody has read it because my email address is in there um, but they forget to go back and leave me a review so if you've read any of my books please go back and leave me a review for each book on Amazon I would appreciate that I'm also on YouTube maybe you like the YouTube format there are a lot of people on YouTube who are not on social media and also don't listen to podcasts I didn't know that until I started a YouTube channel. And I've had a YouTube channel for a few years, but I never did anything with it until I started doing these walk talks. And I had some requests to put them on YouTube so they can be archived. Now, if you're on YouTube watching, or if you're interested in looking at anything I've done in the past as far as walk talk topics, you can actually go to YouTube and search that in the search bar. So if there's a particular Bible verse or issue or something that you wanna know what I've already talked about, Go to YouTube, search it. You can also Google it. So I've archived pretty much everything on my website and on YouTube to where everything is extremely searchable. So if there's a particular Bible verse you're worried about, I've probably talked about it or written about it. You can go to my website, search the topics page, or you can just go to Google, type in that topic plus Matt McMillan Ministries. It'll pop up or on YouTube. So be sure to check that out as well. If you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up and hit the bell button. All right. Um, if you want to contact me, please do not message me on social media. I don't interact with those. You can get a hold of me very easily. You can get a hold of me very easily by just going to my website, going over to the contact page. I'll be glad to interact with you there. All right. So let's get to today. Walk talk. Is suicide the unforgivable sin? This is a hot topic. Now, let me preface this first of all by saying I don't pick hot topics just to pick a hot topic. <laughs> but because our modern church, the error of man made tradition that we are steeped in, when we talk about certain topics, it can seem as a hot topic, but it doesn't have to. That includes the sensitive subject of suicide. There are a lot of people who believe that their loved one did not get to go to heaven because they committed suicide. So we have to come to the realization that when we go to the Bible and we search for suicide in the New Testament letters, we're gonna you know, come to a different conclusion than that. So that's what I'm gonna do today. So I'm gonna talk about that today. I'm going to talk about the rebuttals that most people will use. And then I'm also gonna talk about the, the passages that a lot of people use in order to scare people into not committing suicide. Now, maybe you're watching this in the future. You have just Googled, is suicide the unforgivable sin? This has popped up. Maybe you've YouTubed it and you're trying to find a reason to be able to do it and not go to hell. Let me tell you right now, don't do it. Do not, don't do it. Give it time. I don't care if this has been going on for years and years and years and years. This decision that you are about to make in regard to taking your own life is not what God wants. Do this. You could come back and watch this video, but pick up your mobile device and hit 988. Okay, call 988. If you call 988, that will take you to 
a helpline which will help you get past this moment. Don't, whatever thoughts you have right now to do this, excuses, reasons, people, pain, guilt, condemnation, whatever feelings you're currently having right now, do not do it. Give this time. Okay, so I wanted to put that in the beginning because I know that this is probably going to be searched and it's going to pop up and I want you to know from the beginning, do not do it. And, and here's, here's another thing. So back to the walk talk. When I talk about suicide, a lot of Christians who believe differently than me or unbelievers who believe differently than me, they think that I'm telling people to commit it. <laughs> it's the same thing when it comes to sinning. Because I make such a big deal of Jesus, I have comments that just flood all my posts of stop telling people to sin, stop telling people to sin, stop telling people sin is okay. I never tell anybody to sin. I never tell anybody sin is okay. But when you make a big deal of the truth, because of the error of man-made tradition, people think the opposite of what you're saying. Okay, so the best thing to do when it comes to that is don't respond to it. <laughs> don't fight with them because they've already got their mind so made up that they're mad at you. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, a good friend of mine, I was talking to him yesterday and we were discussing this and, you know, he has a lot of the same desires that I do when it comes to helping people understand the, the new covenant. And he's just such a nice guy, very very well spoken, very articulate. Um, and he, he wants to be able to help people understand the new covenant and me and him, we have the temptation to argue with people who attack. But you know, after we talked for a while, you know, we both came to the conclusion of that's just not, it's not worth it. If somebody's wanting to have a civil conversation during a disagreement, that's great. You know, the Bible says, come and let us reason together, but we don't have to defend ourselves all day. The gospel message in itself, Jesus said, it's a sword. It's going to divide. So when you talk about certain topics such as suicide, and you get to the bottom of what scripture actually says about it and what the actual good news of the gospel is, people can still take this wrong. Matt's telling people to unalive themselves. I'm not, ever. Okay, so do not do it. It is not the right decision. Every single situation of everybody that I know where they have had a loved one who have done this, it has caused them extreme trauma, extreme pain. They are still suffering to this day and it has been years ago. Their family, your family is going to be left here. I don't have any family. That's not the point. The point is you're not done here just yet. Whether you think nobody loves you, whether you think nobody cares, God's not done with you here. Okay. I don't care if you're a hundred years old. Wife is gone. Kids don't talk to you. Bad health. You're not done. God's not done with you. Okay. Give it time. So I want to spend some time on that in the beginning. I also want to spend some time on how do we address people who think what we're saying about suicide is a green light. We're not. Okay. All right. Now, um, you know, suicide it's very common. You know, a lot of people don't understand that. Suicide happens with unbelievers and believers just the same. Some of the reasons why people commit suicide, you know, we can think that these reasons are selfish. And in a way, they are selfish. But when somebody takes their own life, they are trying to end a pain that they think they can never end or will never end. They're trying to get past a feeling that this feeling will probably never go away. It is hopelessness. They are not trying to cause anyone harm. They are actually trying to stop the pain. And sometimes this pain could just come in like a flood. You know, the enemy can get in there and really just, you know, do all of this, these damaging things to your mind, but they're not trying to hurt anybody. So if you have a loved one who has done this, 
they didn't do this to hurt you. They did this because of their pain, their struggles, their hopelessness. So what causes a lot of this hopelessness? I mean, you, the list is endless, but I wanted to start this list out. You know, I'm just going to list a few things here. I want to start this list out, first of all, with religious guilt, religious guilt. Religious guilt causes a lot of people to be completely hopeless. You know, some of the things that you'll hear is, you know, you didn't value church. If you were a true person of God, if you were a true godly man, a true godly woman, you would value church. But yet when you go to church, you feel like a bag of crap. You feel like you don't want to live. You didn't obey pastor. If you would have obeyed pastor, there's no way you would have done this. Or you wouldn't even think about it. More religious guilt. You didn't serve well enough. If you served well enough, you would prove who you are as a child of God. More religious guilt. More religious guilt. Religious guilt, it just it doesn't come in that type of aggressive form all the time. Sometimes it can be just a passive aggressive little caption on a Facebook post. Somebody who is extremely self-righteous all about their behavior, their own looks, their own appearance, their own whatever. They'll put a little passive aggressive caption. It has nothing to do with the gospel. It has nothing to do with how Christ has completely forgiven you, also giving you a new identity. It has to do with religious guilt. You didn't value church. You didn't serve. You, you missed your calling. You didn't look up to this person. But yet you know behind closed doors and even in situations, you, you know these people. You've seen the deep, dark sides of them. You've seen them completely lose their cool. You've seen them do the opposite. But yet you get this religious guilt. And it could be, it could be religious guilt when it comes to complementarianism. You know, you're a female, so you better shut up and sit down and obey your husband. You want to be a pastor? No, shut up. Be silent. And then they take all these passages out of context, which are twisted by the Reformation. And then you think that you are just less than everybody and you don't want to live anymore. And then you got pastors. Pastors who they get into this position, even though it's not a position according to scripture, because they wanted to help people. They love people. They want to lead people to Christ. Not all of them, but there are some that actually want to do that. They completely understand that it's about love. But this mob of a congregation just, you cannot breathe. Everything you teach is wrong. Everything you teach is overblown. Everybody wants a handout. You can't even have a family dinner without getting a phone call. You're always on call 24 seven. You really just don't even wanna be in this position anymore. But now everybody looks to you for every single answer and you don't have the answer. There are pastors who commit suicide. So the religious mindset, which leads to the hopelessness is rampant. We don't want to say this is just for people who are, you know, struggling with drugs or alcohol or whatever else. It's in the body of Christ. And this passive aggressive garbage that puts religious guilt on people. It's got to stop this, this, Pastoral worship, it's got to stop. This is not the ecclesia that Christ died to set up. The ecclesia that Christ died to set up is based on equality, loving one another, serving one another with Christ as the head. That's the church. So, you know, and I want to answer this question before I continue. Is suicide the unforgivable sin? No, it's not the unforgivable sin. What is the unforgivable sin? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? What does the word blasphemy mean? It means to speak ill of. Okay, so I'm a Christian and I spoke ill of Jesus. Okay, you've already been born again. So 
what you say does not determine who you become, what you have believed about Jesus. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is being committed in Matthew chapter 12, Mark chapter 3. The audience are people who are saying, Jesus is not the Messiah. If you have believed Jesus is the Messiah, you are a brand new creation. Your old self dies. Romans chapter 6, Colossians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, dead. Buried in the tomb with Jesus and then fully resurrected as a holy brand new creation. Romans chapter 6, 2 Corinthians 5, John chapter 1. You are a child of God because you have believed. So blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not suicide. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is unbelief. Because if you do not believe that Christ is the Messiah, you are still in your sins. You are still in the power of sin and you will not be saved. You have to receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit has to place you inside of him. You know, the word baptize means to be placed inside of, you know, we want to turn this into a waterworks theology, but the word baptize simply means to be placed inside of, and you cannot be saved unless you are baptized into the spirit, placed into the spirit. This has nothing to do with water. We see baptized mentioned in Romans chapter six, nothing to do with water. You know, over in first Peter three, Peter describes our, baptize, our baptism into the Holy Spirit in the same way that Noah and his family was, air quotes, baptized into the ark. They were placed into the ark, therefore they were saved from the flood. We are placed into the Holy Spirit, therefore we are saved from the coming wrath. We are in the Holy Spirit. You cannot commit the unforgivable sin as a Christian because you have been placed into the Holy Spirit. You have trusted Jesus and it's undoable. If you don't believe this, you are not fully trusting what Christ has done. You are putting your salvation and the salvation of others in something that is different than the life of Christ. But yet uh, Hebrews chapter seven says he is able to save completely because he always lives. So your life becomes Christ's life when you trust him. People hear this and they're like, he's telling people they don't have to do anything. It's the same thing with everything else. When you make a big deal of Jesus, the enemy wants you to think that's not enough or you got to do more. And then they'll go to even the demons believe. Even the demons believe? You, you do not want to compare your belief to a demon. Here's what happens with that. Not only are you comparing your belief to a demon, then you compare your works to a demon. Do you see how not smart that is? The demons know who Jesus is. They know better than we do because they can see the supernatural realm. Here's the difference. They're damned to hell. You're not. You still have the opportunity to believe for salvation. Demons don't. So we can't go to that passage and say, even the demons believe you got to have some type of works. No, do not compare your belief and your works to demons. That is a distraction by the enemy to take your focus off of Jesus. All right. Now, let's talk about some of the major rebuttals to this um, is suicide, the unforgivable sin, you know, because <laughs> we think, and when I say we, this is a soft we, because I don't think this way. We think that we have to scare people into not committing suicide. Is that currently working? Is it working? No, it makes it worse. It makes them think that they are completely alone. Here's another thing that people get. They think because they're having suicidal thoughts that they're not saved. That's in the church too. A real Christian would never even contemplate that. Or you proved you're not a Christian. But yet we have this Christian who made a terrible mistake. And because of that terrible mistake, they think it cannot be undone. They think this is the end. My reputation's gone. My life is over. I'm not a Christian. I may as well just end it all anyway. They move forward with it. But when we go to the Bible 
and we search for the unforgivable sin, it is never talking about suicide. The only unforgivable sin is refusing to believe Jesus has forgiven you by grace. If you don't, you are committing blasphemy. You cannot receive the Holy Spirit. You cannot be placed into the Holy Spirit. You're still in your sins and you're going to be eternally separated from God. Some people will go to, and this is a common passage, you know, I don't want to disrespect people today, you know, because I understand that there are a lot of well-meaning people who use some of these passages in an attempt to prevent people from killing themselves. However, we don't have to use scripture out of context and in error in order to prevent people from killing themselves. We need to give them the truth of these passages and then point them to the hopefulness that is in Christ. So first of all, let's go to 1 John chapter 5. Now, 1 John chapter 5, many people will use this passage. The sin that leads to death. Right there, McMillan. It's the sin that leads to death. This is suicide. And John said, do not pray for the sin that leads to death. It's not suicide. There is nothing in any of these surrounding passages or even in this book, that this letter, which would indicate this is talking about suicide. Nowhere. So what is the sin that leads to death that John said, do not pray for the sin that leads to death? What is the only sin that could possibly cause you to be eternally dead? As in no life of God, completely separated from him in hell. Unbelief. The sin that leads to death is unbelief. Refusing to believe Jesus has forgiven you by no work of your own. That's unforgivable. That will lead you to death. And John says, do not spend time praying for that. Why? Are you saying I can't pray for somebody to believe? Listen, this entire letter is a description of unbelievers compared to believers. It is a contrast of nature. John is battling Gnosticism. The Gnostics had slipped into this small group of Christians, these young Christians. That's why he calls them little children. And the Gnostics said, Jesus is, Jesus never came in the flesh. Okay, and sin is not a real thing. Those two things will prevent you from entering into the kingdom of God. You have to believe Jesus was a human. You have to believe you have to be forgiven. These are sin deniers. That is the sin that leads to death. Now, here's the thing. The reason why John said do not pray for this is because you cannot pray anybody out of unbelief. No matter how hard you try or how much you pray, you cannot pray somebody into believing. So John says, don't pray for that. You can pray for opportunities for them to hear the gospel. You can pray for opportunities for people to come into their lives and people to be removed from their lives. You can pray for them however you want. But if you spend your lifetime praying for somebody to believe, God... He cannot do that. He does not force anybody to believe anything. He doesn't force you to believe anything. It doesn't force me to believe anything. But God can move all these other chess pieces around to where they have a better opportunity to understand the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So pray for that. But this is not suicide. Other people will say, if you commit suicide, that is a murder. And John said, no murderer will enter into the kingdom of God. And there are some other passages where it describes a murderer not going to heaven. <laughs> Christians are not what they do. Christians are not murderers. Christians are not gossips. Christians are not fill in the blank. We are holy saints, children of God, fully sanctified, set apart, righteous, blameless, holy, completely united with the Lord, and we make mistakes. We sin, but we are not what we do. Again, we are not what we do. Only people who don't believe in Jesus are known by what they do. A tree is known by its fruit. We see this in Matthew chapter 7 unbelievers. Christians are not known by their fruit. 
We are known by the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. It's not our fruit. It is His fruit through us. We don't produce this fruit. We bear the fruit of the Spirit. We are a vine. He is the branch. We are not known by our fruit. It is the vine's fruit through us. The fruit of the Spirit. If you think it's your fruit, this is what's going to happen. You're going to wake up every day and you're going to try hard. And you're going to be known by your effort. Paul calls this type of fruit, fruit unto death. This is a type of fruit that the Pharisees were producing. We see this in Matthew. We see this in Romans. You are not known by your fruit. You do not produce fruit. That is an unbeliever, a tree. Christians are never described as trees. We are branches. He is the vine. Trees are completely self-sufficient. This is why all the stuff in the Old Covenant, a tree planted by waters will produce good fruit. Unbelievers who are self-sustaining, who do not rely on the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ within them, that is a tree. A false prophet is somebody who is known by their fruits, their fruit, Somebody who says that is not the Messiah. This is why Jesus said John the Baptist is the greatest prophet. Because John the Baptist said this is the Messiah, the Holy One, the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. These other people were not saying that. They are known by their fruit. Okay, so what you do does not determine who you are as a Christian. Therefore, if you commit a sin, that is not what you are. You are not a sinner. Yeah, but I'm sinning. You're a saint who is sinning. Big day. If you're a sinner, you should be sinning. Paul described his past life as a sinner when he wrote to Timothy in an effort to say, if God can show grace to me, the greatest unbeliever of all time, he can show grace to anybody. He tells this in a first person, present tense story. Just the same as a man walks into the bar. Am I telling you that story now? Yes. But did the man already walk into the bar? Yes. Same thing. Paul is not a sinner. Paul wrote to the saints in Rome, to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Thessalonica. He wrote to the saints, to the saints, to the holy ones. He said, you're righteous in 2 Corinthians 5. Oh, there's no one righteous. He said that early on in Romans. Yes, that is describing an unbeliever. Keep going. It describes Christians shortly after that. The gift of righteousness. He said, you're complete. Colossians chapter 2. He said, you're blameless. Colossians chapter 1. He said, you're a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5. So, Paul's not calling anybody a sinner. Paul is not a sinner. We have to stop confusing identity with actions and attitudes. This includes when somebody does commit suicide. They are not murderers. They are a child of God who made a terrible permanent decision. Look at it this way. In the first chapter of Romans, Paul compares gossip to murder. Why? Because both are sins. Both are not of faith. But then what does he say in Romans chapter 6? The wages of sin is death. Jesus died for that gossiping you're going to do later at the office or on social media. Not you. Not you guys, of course. <laughs> but he's paid for that. That deserves death. Oh, that's not that bad of a sin. Nope, 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 nope. Every sin from gossip to murder. God does not level your sins. Levels of sins began with the early church fathers because they wanted to people to pay them in order to be able to get pay a lot for this type of sin, pay a little for this type of sin. Gossip is just as bad as murder. It is a sin. It is done of, not done of faith. So when you attempt, not you, if the shoe fits, wear it. When you attempt to categorize sins, that's the worst. Oh, that's not that bad. Oh, I only did that this much. Oh, that's, that, you are overlooking every single sin requiring death. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died. So every sin you commit, it is forgiven. Suicide is a sin. It is forgiven. So you're not a murderer. 
whoever did that as a Christian is not a murderer. They're a child of God. And this mistake is going to leave a wake of destruction behind them. But that is not more powerful than the cross. You would be saying this action is greater than what Christ did on the cross. Some people will say in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, if anyone destroys the body, God will destroy that person. And they'll say right here, this is suicide. If anyone destroys the body, God will destroy that person. When we look at this passage, do we see any connotation, any context about suicide? None whatsoever. But because... Our Bibles have chapters and verses, and we can Google, and we could type in something that we're thinking about, and then something that has been interacted with a lot online will pop up on the first page of Google, and we'll say, oh, that's suicide. Or there was a very popular article written on it. That doesn't make it true. It, it's true if it's based on the gospel and it's true if it's based on the context of the entire letter and the audience. So 1 Corinthians 3, if anyone destroys the body, God will destroy that person. This is not about an individual. This is encouragement for this persecuted group of Christians in this Greek city. He even says, all of you are the body. This is not about an individual committing suicide. This is about Paul letting them know at the end, they're going to be destroyed. And that's what happens. We see this in the book of Revelation. They are destroyed. It has nothing to do with suicide. This is talking about the body of Christ as a whole. All right. Oh, okay. Here's some other rebuttals that we get to this. If you commit suicide, how are you going to ask for forgiveness? Man, I hear that when I talk about this. And the reason why people think this way is because they're told God forgives them if they ask for forgiveness. But the words ask for forgiveness are not in the Bible. Even hearing that, you're like, eh, nope, I got to ask for forgiveness. You, you do not ask for what you've already received in full. If you were asking for forgiveness, that would mean Christ would have to die again every time you asked for forgiveness. Because Hebrews chapter 7 says, or Hebrews chapter 9 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So Christ is not getting up and down on a cross every time you sin and then ask for forgiveness. It's finished. By one offering, you have been forgiven. The body and blood of Jesus Christ, Hebrews chapter 10. Some people will say, oh, the Lord's Prayer says ask for forgiveness. No, it doesn't. That's what you've been taught. Again, this is man-made tradition that you've heard, your grandma heard, great-great-grandma heard, and it's been passed down over time. Go read the Lord's Prayer. It does not say ask for forgiveness. It says if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. They, they forgive. They, they totally overlook that part of forgiveness. If you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. This has nothing to do with asking for forgiveness. The words ask for forgiveness are not in the Bible because God only forgives by blood. That is the only way he's ever forgiven anybody since the garden. If you don't shed blood, forgiveness is not going to happen. Before the cross, it was atonement. The blood would be covering your sins after the cross. Propitiation. He remembers your sins no more. First John chapter 2. Matter of fact, it says propitiation twice in First John. Propitiation is not atonement. Atonement is putting it on a credit card. The debt's still there. Somebody's got to pay it. Jesus comes along and cuts that credit card up. So he did more than atone. He propitiated. So there's a big difference in atonement and, and propitiating, but neither of those have anything to do with asking for forgiveness. You don't ask for what you received in full. So when somebody decides to do such a, a bad thing, a terrible thing, a horrible decision, they're already forgiven. You do not ask for what you've already received in full. And then we got, you, oh, how are you going to confess? You got to confess your sins to receive forgiveness. The Jews before the cross never confessed their sins for forgiveness. When they confessed their sins, they were simply admitting that they had sinned. They never confessed for forgiveness. 
they only receive forgiveness once a year at the Day of Atonement by way of animal blood. We receive forgiveness once in our lifetime by grace through faith in Jesus. That's the difference. So you got to come to the realization that when you confess your sins, it is not for repeated forgiveness. It is to get that off of your chest. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us, for, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. All means all. All means all. Sorry, my screen's freezing here. Give me just a second. All right. So, looks like we also got a troll on here. Uh, that might be why my screen's freezing. Give me just a second, guys. Okay, should be good. <laughs> I love live Instagram. It's awesome. All right. So, <laughs> they come out of the woodworks. They're always trying to find a way. <laughs> and I talked about you guys earlier in the video. Go back and, and watch this later on YouTube. <laughs> so, when we go to 1 John 1, 9, this theology of confessing your sins in order to receive forgiveness It's man-made tradition. John was a Jew. John, who wrote this letter, went to the Day of Atonement. He never received forgiveness by confessing. So why would he go from annual forgiveness at the Day of Atonement to confession by confession? He, he wouldn't. This is a confession or admission or agreeing. I'm a sinner. Read the previous verse. Sin deniers. People who say sin is not a real thing. John never said that. John trusted in the one who could forgive him once and for all time, Jesus. And you have done that too. So saying that somebody has to confess their sin in order to receive forgiveness, it's an enemy of the cross. Here's, here's what happens with that. What about the sins you forget to confess? God doesn't forget just because you forget. How are you keeping track? Remember Romans chapter one, gossip to murder, all, everything. You, you, if you, what if you no longer have a voice box? How are you going to receive forgiveness? Do you see how this is an enemy of the cross? This is a one-time confession of faith. This is saying, I'm a sinner. And then you admit Jesus can forgive you. And he does. And he cleanses you of all unrighteousness. All means all. So when you, when you think somebody who commits suicide cannot confess that sin, you're overlooking the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. You know, Peter said he suffered once for sins to bring you to God once. So when you say I have to confess a sin in order to receive forgiveness, you're saying that suffering wasn't good enough. So if you confess, it is good to confess. It is good to get it off your chest. You know, in the book of James, confess your sins to one another so that you can be healed. This is not about physical healing. This is not, not about forgiveness. This is about, man, I'm struggling with this. And it would be good to confess this to somebody before you did it. I'm really having these thoughts. Do you see how confession is a good thing? But repeated confession for repeated forgiveness or saying that there is a caveat that once you commit suicide, you're going to hell because you did not confess a sin is error. What about repentance? How are you going to repent of that sin? So this is a huge reflection of how repentance has been turned into a work. You don't repent of a sin to be forgiven. That is an error created by the frontier revivalists in the 18th century. You repent of unbelief. There are two Greek words for repent in scripture. We have one word in English, repent. Both of those Greek words mean the opposite, nearly. Metaneo, that is the repentance of faith. That is the repentance that saves, going from, okay, Jesus is not the Messiah to Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus has not forgiven me to Jesus has forgiven me. Okay, this is all my works to, nope, this is all grace. That's metaneo. That is the repentance that saves. Then you got metanoia. Metanoia is simply changing your actions and attitudes. There were unbelievers committing metanoia in the gospels. And they were being called snakes, blind, whitewashed tombs. They said their father was the devil, Jesus said. 
So when you commit metanoia, repentance of a particular action or attitude, that does not save you. It is the repentance of metaneo. And we've got, we've got this confused in our church. And because of the frontier revivalist, and the frontier revivalist was a group of people who went from city to city to city trying to save the sinners. And it was pretty much a competition. They were trying to get everybody to come down front to be saved. And they would use all of these scare tactics, all of this pressure in order to put notches on their belt of souls saved. One of their tactics was to say, you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Therefore, the people in the crowd who were struggling with drinking, smoking, cussing, beating their wives, sleeping around, whatever you want to say as a non-churchy sin, they thought, okay, I got to stop that. Nobody has ever stopped sinning to be saved, ever. And then they pushed this into the church liturgy. It became part of the church service where you got somebody up on stage who now knows a lot of scripture yet they don't understand the new covenant or what Christ has done. And they'll say, the woman was told to sin no more. You got to repent of your sins. And then they use the sin no more passage. And the reality is Jesus didn't tell her to repent. She trusted Jesus. And Jesus said, you are not condemned. Who really needed to repent of Metaneo? The people holding the stones. Not the woman caught in in adultery. But because of man-made tradition and this works-based theology of you have to repent of your sins and then sin no more, it is a good thing to not sin, but you do not not sin in order to be saved. And when you hear this, like Matt's telling people to sin, we're right back to it. We're right back to it. Because granddad taught it, great-great-granddad taught it, great-great-great-granddad taught it, all the way back to the 18th century with the frontier revivalists because we were saved as a, at a great event. Oh, he came into town. It was such a great event. There was 349 people that came to the Lord. I was there. I was there. It was a great event. The moment I gave my life to the Lord. You didn't give your life to the Lord. You were born spiritually dead. Christ gave you his life. The book of Ephesians says, you were dead in your transgressions. You had no spiritual life to give to Jesus. You needed to receive his life. Colossians chapter 3. Christ who is your life. Your salvation is the life of Christ. You know, Jesus says, because I live, you also will live. You think you gave your life to the Lord, but you didn't. You think you stopped sinning good enough. You repented good enough, but you didn't. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm saying you might have been saved in error. (laughs) Because if you think you left that revival, or you think you repented of your sins, and stopped sinning, you are saying you do not need Jesus. Because repenting of your sins in order to be saved would would basically be saying, I'm saved until I sin again. What's the point of Christ? But because of man-made tradition, we hear, "Eh, eh, eh," Matt's telling people to sin, Matt's giving people license to sin. Nobody needs to be told to sin. Everybody's sinning just fine. Nobody needs a license to sin. Everybody's sinning just fine without one. And when you put them under any new type of commandment, whether it's from Moses, Mama, the revivalist, pastor, you will get sin afforded. Romans chapter 7. Thou shalt. Sin will be afforded. Sin will be your master. Or you can bounce over to grace and you can realize I repented of unbelief. I was saved. And now I am repenting, committing metanoia metanoia in order to mature in order to enjoy my salvation but i'm never going to confuse my actions with my belief 
So when somebody says, if you commit suicide, you can't repent of that sin, that has no biblical foundation whatsoever. Repent of your sins is not in the Bible. Repent is, it's all over the place. Metaneo and metanoia. But not repent of your sins. And you might be going to Acts 2.38, Acts 3.19. Right here it says, repent of your sins. It does not. There's only one translation that says, repent of your sins. That's the NLT. And it's an error. They need to update it. None of the other translations say that. Why? Because it is not the repentance of anything which saves you. It is the repentance of faith. It is the obedience of faith. Paul talks about the obedience of faith all throughout the book of Romans. You have to repent of, I do not believe I can do something about my sins. Or I, I do believe I can do something about my sins too. I do not believe I can do something about my sins. Oh, you're saying you shouldn't repent? Right back to it. Right back to it. Do you see it? These people are obsessed with sinning. These people are obsessed with how you are behaving. These people are obsessed with how much better they're doing than you. How they make church an awesome place to be. And this is everything. And this is all, everything in my life is about church, 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 church. Behave, behave, behave. But isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome that when you go there, all you hear about is behavior. Obey pastor. Give your money if you want to be blessed. That's not the ecclesia. That's not the church. That's not the repentance that saves. That's not the repentance that will keep you out of heaven. The repentance that will keep you out of heaven is saying, I can do something about my sins. And you've never trusted in Jesus. Now, there are a lot of Christians who just struggle with that. They're still saved. So we don't want to say, you know, there's a lot of Christians who they, they have trusted Jesus. But this error is just going to cause a bunch of problems in their lives. It's easier. It's lighter. It's burden free. It is not picking on individual people's sins. <laughs> it is not making light of sin. It's making a bigger deal to Jesus. So when you say if somebody commits suicide, they can't repent of that sin. Therefore, they're unforgiven. They're going to hell. That is error. So, so is suicide the unforgivable sin? No. The unforgivable sin is a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is refusing to believe in Jesus by grace, which will cause you to not be placed inside the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, which will cause you to not be saved. The unforgivable sin is saying, I don't trust Jesus. I've never trusted Jesus. That's the unforgivable sin. If a Christian commits suicide... They go to heaven. We have to deal with that fact. Jesus does not leave somebody in their darkest moment. Jesus does not walk away or abandon you or no longer be committed to you because you're struggling with a severe mental illness or a severe depression or a severe mistake or a severe loneliness or a severe feeling that you think will never go away. Jesus is there and he'll never leave you. No created thing can separate you from him. Romans chapter 8. You are a created thing. A hundred and twenty five people take their lives every day. Suicide is the twelfth leading cause of death. Five people per hour take their lives. This walk talk's been going on about an hour. As I've been talking, five people have taken their lives. How many of them do you think would not take their life if they had the hope that they knew they ultimately had because of the commitment of Jesus? How many of them do you think would not do that because they knew there is still some, some type of hope because of Jesus? When you are faithless, 
the Bible says, he remains faithful. There's always hope. We have to stop threatening Christians with hell over suicide and we need to point them to the hope that they have in Christ instead. So if that's you and it's something you've been thinking about, there is hope. There is hope. You might not think there's hope. You might think there's no other way to stop this pain. You might think this mistake that you made is just the end of the world, but there's not. Or it's not. Give it time. Jesus is with you. Jesus will never leave you. Something good will come out of this somehow. You will feel better somehow, some way later on. But just know your feelings do not indicate truth. The truth is indicated by Christ. Christ is in you. Christ is with you. And he'll never leave you. Don't do it. Pick up your phone right now. You might be watching this on your phone. Flip over to the phone part of your phone and dial 988. Get some help. Don't do it. Give it time. Is it forgiven? Yes. Will you go to heaven? Yes. But now is not your time. There's still more for your life on earth. So I hope this has encouraged you today. I hope it's brought to light some of the error about suicide and everything that comes along with this terrible stigma. I hope it's also brought to light maybe some, some hope for you. Maybe you've got a loved one that you were worried about for a long time and you had people telling you that they went to hell. They didn't go to hell. They're in heaven. Don't believe that lie. Christ's commitment is greater than that sin. So, always tell, you, tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? You're righteous, you're holy, you're blameless, you're a new creation, you're a child of God. There's nothing wrong with you, and there is always hope because of Jesus. Always. So always tell the truth about yourself. Always be yourself. Love y'all. Bye.